Essayist and novelist Gore Vidal is one of the best-known literary figures in America. He was part of the circle of great young writers who dominated America's cultural scene in the wake of the Second World War. His diverse works, ranging from historical novels to political and literary essays, share the common thread of his signature wit and biting satire. Vidal's palimpsest is the memoir that he said he would never write, and I am pleased to have him here to talk about it now that he has written it. Welcome. Now, let me just go back over definition. I said, I asked you this before, palimpsest? Palimpsest. Everybody said, oh, why did you pick a word nobody knows? They'll be embarrassed <laughs> in the bookstores. They can't remember it. Yeah. But it's such a nice word. It says very clearly, a memoir, right. which is the world as I remembered it, which does not mean that it is perhaps all that accurate, but its memories is very inaccurate. Hence the title palimpsest, because it means in the 17th century, they take a parchment, they'd right. write something on it, then they'd erase Rock part that. of it and write something else yeah. over it and write something. So you get different layers. Well, that's how memory works. Yeah. Memory is one layer upon another. It, we, we looked up the definition, paper, parchment, prepare for writing on and wiping out again like a slate, a parchment which has been written upon twice, the original writing having been rubbed out. Uh, and so that hits that, uh, this cover, is that part of... Uh, the cover, well, I stopped at the age of 39. I don't, I don't want to give the impression I still look like that. That was taken 35 years ago when I was 35. Yeah. I've just turned 70. Yeah. I remember when Mary McCarthy turned 70. Somebody said, what does it feel like, Miss McCarthy, to be 70? She said, I feel just as usual, but uh, I don't like the way I look. <laughs> <laughs> so is that the way well, you feel? Very fair answer, yes. Uh, yeah, but you've done I pretty like well, my friend. I mean... You know, my age has, as someone even noted in one of the reviews I read, that, that Gore um, looks pretty good. Well, that's for because I've become a movie star. I took that up in my late 60s, and yeah. now that I'm 70, I'm working with, <laughs> co-starring with Charlie Sheen in a movie. What's the new movie? It's called The Shadow Conspiracy. Yeah, this comes out of your experience with Tim Robbins. With Tim Robbins and Bob Roberts, yeah. and then I was in a picture with uh, Joe Pesci. Yeah. Called, well, what was with that? Honors. With, with Honors. honors. And uh, oh, I love acting. Do you? Well, you don't think about anything <laughs> while you're doing it. Your brain just goes blank. And I have, I have rather high blood pressure. And mine's absolutely normal while I act because it, it, adrenaline gets burned up. So it's very easy for me. For, if I had talent, it would be extremely difficult. But as I have absolutely none, I just Well, Bob, uh, in Bob Roberts, Bob, Bob, what was it called? Bob, Bob Roberts. Bob yeah. Roberts. I mean, that was mainly you, didn't they? They just put the camera on you. I mean, it was not a scripted was, monologue. It was... That was Tim Robbins, was the director, writer, star. Well, his and words said, are your words. Uh, mine. Yeah, that's why right. well, at, the, at the end, he said, why don't you stay over a day and we'll do a shot with you. You know, after you've lost the election to this evil person played by Tim Robbins, demagogue, so I thought a little bit about Pat Moynihan. I even had a little, little bow tie on. Yes. And, uh, so he would, Tim would fire me questions as if he were an interviewer, and I'd invent the answers on the spot. And it was all I had to do. Because with an empty head, you don't know what's going to come out, and they can always edit it later if something that should not come out does come out. So that gave me a little, little second career. Here. So you, know, you, you and Fred Tump, you know it could lead you to the United States Senate. Fred Thompson as you know, had an acting career, a lawyer, and he is now the junior senator from Tennessee. Well, so he, that career I that want you, to say that he is my role model, but uh, <laughs> actually it's Ronald Reagan. Yes. There's a great picture in here which I want to show. He, oh, this is it. Can you come in on this? Here is you with... Uh, Tennessee Williams has his hand around your shoulder, and there is uh, JFK. Tell me, right. about, tell me about the two of them. Well, I, we were, I got a call from Jackie. I was writing the movie of Suddenly Last Summer in Miami, and Jackie rang and said, can you come up for lunch in Palm Beach? That Jack is, uh, we're both dying to meet Tennessee Williams, so we came up. And this was about 1957, and Jack's already running for president, but Tennessee is very, very vague about who's who. He gives it, now, are you a senator or a governor? I, I'm, I can't get this very clear. I'm, 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 I'm actually, I'm a senator. And uh, he said, uh, then they kept on chatting away, and then Jack pulled out some guns, and he was shooting at a target. Uh, and said, would you in like to take a Springs? shot? In Palm, in Palm Springs, Springs. Oh, right on that, that lawn where the, the alleged rape case was to no, take Palm place. Beach, but, not Palm, 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 Palm Beach, Palm Beach. And uh, so Jack was shooting away, not terribly effectively, and he gave the gun to Tennessee. We took it like that. He called, not called Tennessee for nothing. He just took it like that. And went, 
three bullseyes. Jackson, well, that's very good. And uh, it is, and considering I was using my blind eye. <laughs> <laughs> then as Jack was going in the house, Tennessee said, um, that, that's a very attractive boy. I said, Tennessee, you cannot cruise the next president of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> oh, he said, he's not going to be president. He's much too attractive for the American people. <laughs> Later, I told Jack that Tennessee had found him attractive sexually, and Jack said, that's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you, why did you stop this when you did? Why only age 39? Well, it was getting so, it would get so long. I've had a long life and started. My first book was published when I was uh, 19, 20. Yeah. So I've been around such a long time. So this is like part one. I mean, there'll be another There might be part a part two. two, or there might not be a part two, but what, what, practically everything that happens to you in life happens. It's mm -hmm. really happened by 25. Yeah, you say that. I mean, I want to come back to that mm -hmm. point. But you say this is memoir and not a biography because? Because uh, it's the way the memory works. and. If you break your leg, let's say, when you're 10 years old and you're now 60 years old, and you start to remember the trauma of breaking your leg, you, this is this interesting thing from the, from the brain people, that you, the neuro neurologists, that you don't remember the actual trauma. You remember the last time you remembered. And that time, you were remembering the previous time you remembered. Yeah. And previous. Well, each time it gets a bit altered. Hence, a palimpsest. One thing is being written yes, over right, another. Right, another. Right, right. So ultimately, your memory is just what you're left with, a whole series of layers. And as you investigate it, you see some, some things are true and some things can't be true. Then I check myself against all these, everybody I know seems to have had a dozen biographies written about him, so I read about myself in these books. And that certainly spurs memory, as I have to give my side of the case. But memoir rather than biography, because biography also has to be more factual and well, you know, memoir be story. Can be, you've got to be more And you've got to get your facts straight and so on. And the dates. And I don't even bother with any of that. It's just if I recollect something like the story I just told you about Tennessee and, and the gun and Palm Beach. Uh, that's really what's left of it to me. Some have said that you use this to get even with Truman Capote no. and with Anais Nin and with... That was only one reviewer here in New York yeah. City, somebody who should be put out to pasture almost immediately as we speak. <laughs> put out to pasture? Well, he's old and... No, he... I know him. He's not that old. He's a nice man. Oh, come on now. He must be about 80 now. No, he's he's not right. 80? Well, he bade, he, I know he gave Washington Irving a bad review and that was 1810. <laughs> No, I said, uh, he's absurd uh, and... But I mean, did you use this? I mean, it's not beyond you to use no. these musings and memoirs to... Well, it's not beyond to, anybody to use to make your case, perhaps, but uh, to answer questions, uh, if you have opposed, as I have, a political system as thoroughly and doggedly and continuously the financial system of the United States, the people who own the media are the people who own the country, and they don't like what you say. So they try to ignore you. If that doesn't work, they begin to demonize you or trivialize you. And so you're saying that the New York Times wants to demonize you and trivialize in, you? In principle, in principle. And for nearly um, well, for six books, I was blacked out by the New York Times. This is after blacked out, meaning they didn't review them? They no. would not review anything in the Daily Times, nor did Time, nor did Newsweek. I was then driven, and it's sort of the center of this book, I was then driven. In order to make a living, since uh, my books were not being reviewed, I went into television, yeah. the movies, and the theater. You know, I never re realized you wrote the screenplay for Ben-Hur. Not only Silent Last Summer, but yeah. Ben-Hur. Yes, indeed I did. But didn't get credit. Because Charlton a... Heston? He had nothing to do with it. You see, this is what happens when you read this guy in the Times. Right. Uh, he says, I am angry at Charlton Heston. Right. Charlton Heston, to me, I mean, I start to smile when I talk about him. I mean, he is the greatest goose on earth. The greatest goose? Goose, yeah. I mean, I was denied credit on it. He had nothing to do with it. He, did, he never knew who wrote the script. Uh, the, the producer knew, Sam Zimbalist, and he died. So it was all up in the air, and William Wyler, a very nice guy, the director, wanted Christopher Fry, the other writer, and myself as, uh, as co-writers. I only brought it up because it ended in great lawsuits and changed the rules of the Writers Guild of America. 
Heston then wrote about me in his diaries, so I make some fun of it. What does he say about you? Oh, I don't know. It's, well, he keeps redoing it, so he, I don't know <laughs> what, right. what, what it is lately. <laughs> he does have new memoirs out. Uh, I want to show two people. One, this is Jimmy Trimble, as he looked the last time I saw him when he was 17 in 1942. What I was not, he was in the other way around. Just reflect on this, because this is the heart of this book. Well, we grew up together, and I was one week older than he, and we went to school together. He was the greatest athlete in the school, and I was already a writer. And we had, the one thing we had in common was that uh, we were already, as schoolboys, we were what we were going to be all our lives. I was going to be a writer. By the time he was 17 and graduated from St. Albans, he was offered a contract with the New York Giants as a pitcher, something that's never happened to a 17-year-old before. And by 19, I had my first book was published. We had that in common, and uh, it was a kind of wholeness. We were like two parts of uh, the same person. And then we were separated by time and war at 17. I enlisted in the infantry and then got sent out to the Aleutian Islands, by which time I was the first mate of the ship. I'd moved over to the Transportation Corps. He enlisted in the Marines, and 50 years ago, last March, he was uh, killed at Iwo Jima. So as I said to one interviewer once, this was sort of the unfinished business of my life. Not that uh, there was anything that was of a prurient nature. It was two halves of the same whole which would have adjusted, as I said, I say in the book, I said I had, we had, I had no idea of growing old with him. I just wanted to go on growing up with him. When he was, he had a girlfriend, and he was all set to get married as soon as he got back. But how were you the mirror images of each other? How were you twins? How were you, I mean, you were a writer, he was an athlete. Uh, well, uh, you both were attractive young men, you both were obviously bright, you both were full of life. Well. Doesn't that, that isn't your question the answer to it? That, that each saw in the other what he was not, and that there was a sort of balance between the two. In the symposium, Plato writes about it, and he said that he has Aristophanes say it at this dinner party, and Aristophanes tells the story about originally there were three sexes. There was a hermaphrodite, a male, a female. Round, must have been rather unpleasant looking, these three. And they angered Zeus the god, so he split the hermaphrodite in half, which means that every boy looking for a girl and every girl looking for a boy, they're actually looking for the completion of themselves, which had been dissected, bisected rather, by Zeus. Ditto in the case of the male, ditto in the case of the female. Each looks for the complementary half to a whole. I don't think anybody does it consciously. I certainly didn't. And I don't think if you search for it, you would find it. Either something like that happens in life, and it can be quite unexpected with the most unexpected person. Then there it is. And that, to me, as I was writing this memoir, it became clear and clearer to me that this was the story I was telling, 50 years dead, and, uh, you know, we writers have great vanity, from the great Shakespeare down to me. And Shakespeare in the sonnets was making it very, very clear that he could make someone immortal that he cared about. Well, I don't know if I can make anyone immortal, but I can bring him back to life, which I did. I had researchers out there. I was getting reports from Marines who had served with him in the Pacific. Talked to his mother, talked to the girlfriend, and suddenly I've, I've brought a ghost back. And it was rather nice. It was, Shall we call it exorcism? I don't know, but it was unexpected. So that is what palimpsesting le led me to, and rather a surprise. You have never met anyone who made you feel the same way, that made you reach this wholeness? No, because then I don't think um, I, like so many people, was always in youth. I was into lust. I was not into uh, in, uh, real entanglements. And in fact, you say that's the best part of it. Well, lust and uh, the idle encounter was exactly what I liked, Jack Kennedy liked, Tennessee Williams and Marlon Brando. Yeah, yeah. I mention all four of us because we're more or less contemporaries, 
Uh, we were both promiscuous to a degree that is not possible in the age of AIDS, but we certainly were. We have been